Going into the cage uh, feels a lot easier than going out on a mission in real life. You go out there and you don't know if you're coming back home. You can walk across an IED, you know, anything could happen, right? Helicopter crash. You know, stepping into the cage, I think that gives me a big mental edge and advantage over my opponents. And I just know I can bring you to the deep waters. I can bury you mentally. So that's it gives me confidence to go in there and perform in the UFC. So I was born in the South Coast, Massachusetts, um, about 45 minutes south of the city of Boston. Um, grew up in a town called Freetown, it's kind of a country, uh, stick, woods kind of town. Anything I ever did when I was a kid, I was trying to be like the best at it. I'd try to go full in on it. Hockey was my number one overall thing. Uh, that was my original goal when I was a kid, is just be a professional hockey player. I was just, you know, playing competitive hockey, traveling around the state of Massachusetts and New England and greater area. My goal was to try to play college hockey and then go to the NHL. My senior year, my last hockey game of the season, uh, first shift, uh, went into a corner, a uh, kid fell down, I tripped over and blew out my shoulder. So my whole, you know, everything I was really working for my entire life is to play college hockey. I kind of missed that opportunity. I found my way uh, doing MMA. Uh, like anytime I struggled with anything in my life, I would go into uh, the martial arts gym, just kind of deal with my issues, and I was kind of lost at that time. So I, uh, you know, turned to martial arts and started training. And uh, before I knew, I had my first MMA fight when I turned 18. Um, I was like, all right, I want to do this. So college went out the window. My family kind of <laughs> was like, all right, you know, they supported me. They go, well, if you're not going to go to college, you got to get a job. So I started working construction. So I did that for a couple of years after I graduated high school and. Uh, kind of decided, I was like, I don't know if I want to do this construction thing forever. Um, that kind of sent me to, you know, the, uh, looking into the military. I talked to the Air Force recruiter. It told me about this job called Combat Control and Pararescue. So um, and I switched my MMA training that I was already in really good shape for. Ended up taking the test and passing, and the rest is history. Pipeline's around two and a half years, and we would call the pipelines a series of schools. So initially, you have selection. You have to go through air traffic control school. You have to go to survival school, which we call SEER. We have to go to airborne, and then you go to combat control school. Combat control school is where you kind of take all those skills you learned initially, and you put them all together, and you learn how to be a combat controller. I got a lot of my ability to stay calm and relaxed in really high stressful situation is from the water confidence you do for dive school. So you go through training and you make friends like a couple. You know, you make a couple really good friends. You live with them for like two and a half years. So one of these guys. Um, I was friends with is George Hernandez. He was a uh, big Mexican kid, uh, wrestler. He was, first of all, always like kind of like a role model. He was a little ahead of me, um, but he was like physically one of the strongest beasts I've ever seen in my entire life. On the weekends, me and him would get together. And whenever we could have some extra time, we would, we would roll and just train on the weekends and stuff. So when I was checking in, he was at the 23rd STS. Um, they were in Afghanistan, and then my squadron, the 22nd, was gonna go and check them out. So there was a, a uh, layover where they were there and we were there at the same time. So that was the last time I actually saw him. Um, it was cool though, we had a mats. So me and him would, would go, go train. He started getting into jujitsu at that point. And that's, where, that's my ball game. So I mean, uh, we were rolling every, every chance we had to. So that's cool. I had my deployment to Afghanistan. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, it was, a, it was definitely a, a little bit of action-packed deployment. Um, it was right when uh, Trump took office. Uh, with ROEs kind of were a little lightened up um, compared to what we had be pre previously to that. So we were going out and pushing on missions. You know, I came home at the, around the same time. Um, I lost George. So George uh, got into a, 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 an accident on, on New Year's. That was affecting me. Uh, another one of my friends, Dylan Elchin, when he deployed, at, oh, when we got checked out, they came into Afghanistan. He got blown up in an IED. So I lost a couple of these guys that I went through my training with. And um, I was kind of just lost, I think, coming back. From, just getting adjusted back into normal society, coming from overseas, coming back to normal. It's just a little bit different. So I just did what I, what I always did is, you know, go back into the martial arts gyms and, and and train is, you know, I mean, to keep my mind off things. So that's what I did. I started taking fights because I was like, I started getting better then than I ever had previous in my life. I just, it kind of skyrocketed on like my skill level. And I think it's due to all the training I had from being a combat controller mentally and, and physically. Yeah, so I took three amateur fights while I was still active duty. And, you know, I, I won a couple of those and, uh, you know, I made the decision I wanted to get out and try to chase the CFC. And I always say like the military is a little bit kind of like a gang. Like it's like once you're in, it, it's hard to get out. You know what I mean? Uh, paycheck wise, you know, it's a safe, secure job. 
um, the community, the bonds I've made with all my friends in the military, and you know, getting out, there's a lot of unknowns. Didn't really have any secure job. I was just trying to do anything and everything I could. You know, so I basically just started trying to train people in martial arts. You know what I mean? And, and do privates and make money, enough money to be able to put back into my camp, and so I can, you know, try to fight. When I first fought, I, ha I had a couple fight, professional fights. When I moved home right away, um, off right off the bat, I got a seven-second knockout. Um, I had another fight after those 56 seconds, and then the uh, the pandemic hit. So um, that really slowed down everything. So I couldn't get a fight. I, only, I fought once during the pandemic for that entire year. It was good because it gave me a, a chance to build my skills and not fight right away, but it was bad because I wasn't able to get fights. I felt like I wasn't fighting, I wasn't making money. It was like, it was, what, did I make the right choice? I got out of the military, didn't really have anything really going for me. But I had my contender series fight, fought Francis Marshall. Needless to say, he was the better man on that night. We had a war. Um, Dana White was even, even impressed with us, saying like stuff like, oh, that could have been any prelim on, on a UFC fight. So. It was cool, but I didn't get the win, so I didn't get the contract. Um, so it was kind of like building up that, that pivotal point, and I didn't get it. So it was kind of that was, that was definitely a letdown. Coming back, I came back. You know, I am not a quitter, so I kind of was just like, you know, I'm gonna look at it as I wash back. I made it up there, but I didn't get it. But I'm, you know, I'm just go back to back to work. So that's actually when I started training with the Noon Cartel for for like about six months, and then we got really lucky. I got the call for. Uh, Dana White's looking for a fight. It's a show on YouTube that Dana White travels around and he finds talent around, across the country. So but they call me like, hey, we're gonna have you on uh, episode 10, so the last last episode of the uh, Contender Series. So I was like, all right, cool. And I went in there and I fought, I fought uh, his name was uh, Jair Ferreras. And I, you know, I, I won the fight. I just brought it to him for, I brought him into deep waters. He was a good striker. He hit me a couple times pretty good for sure. But I just kept on taking him down and pressuring him. And just, um, like I said, just bringing him into deep waters and, and, and I got the win. It was a huge point in my life, man. I, that's everything I ever worked for. It made it so much, so much more worth it to me. I like to take the hard way up the mountain every time. Carter's military training, uh, it, it permeates through his work ethic. I mean, he is Johnny on the spot. Uh, he's very proud of his military service. It was really cool to hear him talk about it. Yeah, when you've been through some of the things that connor has been through on the military level, you know, fighting's just, uh, you know, another day. So um, I think he brings that energy in here and, and I think really enjoys every moment he has on the mats and every time he steps in the octagon. Kid drives two hours one way just to get here. When he's here, he puts his head down, he works hard. It's yes, sir, thanks coach. It's, uh, he's very respectful. But the biggest thing is he's a good example for the younger guys. Like he came in, he was the young guy for a little bit. And as we brought in some more fighters underneath him, he's really been a good example for those guys of how to like handle yourself like a consummate professional. He puts his head down, works hard every single day. Um, and when we come here, whether you're doing MMA full time, doing it part time, or just doing it for a hobby, um, we all can take something from what Connor gives us. I think about George all the time. Um, the, one of my, the last text message I received from George says, hey, Connor, you're going to the top. After, it was after one of my amateur fights and my, when I first came back to fighting. I'm in a hard part of my fight camp. I think about George, because George was, like I said, a monster. He was a savage. Like, and um, it just fuels me to push harder. And then I just know he's with me when I go into the cage and I fight. I am them, I am Boston, so it's like, I'm just a represent, I'm the living spirit of what a Boston kid is, you know what I mean, who I am. I live that life and it's just gonna go out there and show, people are gonna see who we are. There's not, it's not a coincidence why the guys from Boston are these tough, gritty nose fighters like Calvin Cater and Joe Lozon and Rob Fawn. We don't ever get finished easy, and we bring it to people to the very end. I mean, I was that when I went down into the pipeline for combat control and I, and I performed that way, I was known as the tough, kid who can just keep on going and going and going. And that's what I'm gonna do as a fighter. That's who I am. I f I'm representing the community that I came from. I was a combat controller. That's gonna be who I am for the rest of my life. We're warriors and you know what? Those guys, they, my friends, you know, literally lost their lives, you know what I mean? They're the same kind of person that I am. I'm just putting it into a sport and you know, and I'm, but I feel like I'm representing them when I'm on there. I, I, it's not about me, it's about those dudes that, you know, go out there and gave their lives and am showing the world what, what that spirit looks like.